Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you very much for coming here to hear more about Eagle Eye. Uh, we have a mixture of uh, people here. Uh, some of you who've had the wisdom to invest in this company. Some of you, we hope, uh, uh, when you've heard a little bit more about us, you might be tempted. We are a SaaS platform uh, servicing a fast-changing retail trade, and we believe that the services we offer are needed now more than ever as uh, the retail trade, like most business sectors, is affected by disruptive technology. We have proven technology, and it's proven because we've done it on a massive scale, of which more later. Um, we have a very strong competitive positioning through the digital wallet. As chairman, um, I won't try and explain the details of the digital wallet, but we have a man here later who will. We've got strong market drivers, but touching really on what I, touched, what I said earlier, that is to say, um, we believe that the retailers need us now more than ever. Um, we would say this, wouldn't we? But we are proud of our management team. We have a, uh, a, a management team uh, that would fit a much larger business than we are today. And that's why I have confidence that this team will take us forward. Um, we've got growing recurring revenues. We don't start every year uh, needing to raise the same re the amount of money. Um, uh, uh, and I think Lucy touches on that later, hopefully. And a very important matter, because I don't think the market's fully understood this, we have sufficient funding to take us forward uh, to achieve our objective of being EBITDA positive in the very near future. And we have an extensive customer base, and we're not reliant on any one or two uh, major customers. Enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Tim uh, to take you through the business in more detail. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, the, the, the market in which we exist, the market in which we trade. And then uh, my colleague's going to talk about how we do it and what we do. And we'll bring it together at the end and, and show you some numbers and, 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 why, uh, and what we think the investment case is for the business going forward. Um, it's a sort of self-evident thing to say, but the world is completely transformed by digital, but many of our customers are not. And uh, one of the games I play, we haven't got time to play it today, is to think of all the things starting with M that have been transformed by digital music, money, uh, messages, maps, media, marriage. Uh, it's amazing if you try and go, and you can play this game at home, as how many, how many things starting with M have been transformed by digital. As a result of that, what's happened, and you know, I, I know this is self-evident, but, but I think it helps to contextualize us, a whole load of new bi digital businesses have emerged that exist in that world, and they are pure plays. And then there are a load of businesses that have emerged that actually transcend the two. They move from the digital to the physical, the bookshop, the taxi, uh, the restaurant meal, whatever it may be. And then, of course, there are the existing incumbents who have created digital versions of themselves to exist and try to prosper in this world. The thing about these businesses is they're all digitally enabled and they are all data driven. One of the ways to think about Eagle Eye is we're the connection guys. And connection is absolutely critical in this game. The connection guy in places is Google. Uh, the connection guy in things is obviously the Internet of Things. And then what is the connection, you know, uh, who are the connection guys in people? Well, obviously there's messages and there's media and, the, and the, uh, there's other things. But how do businesses connect to their customers? And that's where we come in. Because the reality is that physical spaces at the moment are a digital black hole. Um, so you know, if you go back to that, uh, you, you, you know all about it. You know, you, you know where it is. Autonomous lorries can drive to the back door and deliver. No driver, and presumably a robot will help unload them. Um, the, uh, the fridges, the lights, the air conditioning system is all being monitored with an inch of its life. And you know that the meat fridge on the end of R3 is not running right, and an engineer is automatically called to come and fix it. And a customer walks in the door and you haven't got a clue who they are. It's just nonsense. 
So what we are saying is that you have the ability to turn that digital black hole into a place of light, insightful activity by using the mobile phone. And that is what we help to enable. And we are a key part of that. And the reason that we're a key, a key part of that is because any, uh, any digital store, that thing in the, in, in the middle, the, the thing with the picture, is made up of three things. It's customers, a connection to them, and the content. And we are the connection guys. Without us, this doesn't work. Yeah? So we are the thing that links that together that enables you to turn a physical space into a digitally connected space. Um, now, there's a lot of components of a, a, a digital shopping trip, if you like. The first thing is it exists way before the shopping trip starts, and it's about the website, uh, the app, or whatever. The second thing is you've actually got to get people to the physical space. When you get them there, you've got the opportunity to actually do something that is really cool and different, and that's marketing in the now, and I'll talk about that a bit later. You've got to have content, because otherwise, why would they bother to connect? You've got to have reasons to redeem. Otherwise, if they don't show themselves, show you that they're there, if they don't identify themselves, if they don't redeem in some way, you don't know they're there. Even though they may be connected in some way, you, do, you, you, know, you don't know what they're doing, and therefore you are, you are missing. And then finally, that has to be connected at the till, so you know the who and the what. Yeah? Now, what Eagle Eye does is it has an app. On an app, it has locations to get you to the store. It knows when you, we can help predict when that person will shop. And if you've got a beacon or Wi-Fi, it knows when you're in the store. So we can push notify now marketing. We can help with content, we push promotions, and we're connected at the till. So actually, our app business, and most of our clients are not, I mean, for example, Loblaw is not an app client. So it's not all that we do. But to give you an indication of what we can do and what we do do for restaurant businesses and others, and then, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is in this area here through loyalty, through promotions, through offers. Um, but actually, in various of our products, and, and we're always connected at the till, but various of our products perform in different ways along the digital customer journey. I said I'd talk a little bit about now marketing. The thing that's transformed Google, as I'm sure you all know, is near me searching. Um, and the thing that will transform marketing is now marketing. You are in the restaurant, I will send you an offer now for that restaurant. You are in the store, I will send you an offer now to use in that. Not an hour before, not a week before, but actually when you're there. And I think that that will transform, because it has utility in the same way as Nia has utility, it will transform the uptake of digital marketing. Now, that happens in two ways. One is just content, because again, remember, what we are trying to do is to get the phone out of the purse, out of the pocket, and into the hand where it, when they're in the shopping trip. So it's about content, but it's also about relevant and personalized offers. offers. So it could be an offer for oranges, but actually the clue is here. It's an offer for nappies or diapers. Um, now, the, the, as I said earlier on, the critical thing is that we get this registered at the cash registers. So that it, and this is why I call it Reasons to Redeem. It may be an app. It may be that, and, and if you do have one, loyalty schemes are great. They trap a lot of customers and a lot of information. It could be that you're running a gift program. Most people do not trap the identities of their gift customers in order to use that as a repeat marketing platform. It could be digital games with rewards redeemable in the store. It could be that you simply receive a push promotion. It, as you will have seen increasingly, it's about actually cutting the phone technology into the very essence of the mission. You scan and shop, you order in advance, and you pay at table. What you need is you need a combination of these things so that people have at least one, if not many different reasons, to identify themselves, to redeem, and once they've redeemed, Ka-ching, you can make the data loop, and then you can decide what the next best message is. Um, the critical thing, uh, 
which I learnt um, 30 years ago in my early Tesco club card days, um, uh, was you have to get a return on the data. If you're going to spend all this money getting the data, you have to get a return on it. And the only way you can get on a return on it is by doing something with it. So you have to create a model which is, yeah, we'll get the data, we'll turn that into insight, we will we'll do something, and that will then, we'll, we'll measure it. In Tesco's case, it was driving loyalty, but it might be like-for-like like sales. But generally, I would recommend what you're looking at is, is it driving loyalty or more activity? And then you go back round again, and you carry on again, and you do it again and again. And, and basically, we have to work with customers who want to do this. If you're not interested in the data, actually, don't bother with the digital connection. So, but, but I think less and less there are businesses who believe that you can survive without this. So you know, you're going with the flow. So in summary, it enables you to know, this digital connection enables you to know your customer. It enables you to analyze your customer. It enables you to create personalized direct marketing programs. And the interesting thing about this is it's free, of course. Yeah? So a, a ton of Amazon's marketing is free. It's email. And if you're paying to do all your marketing, and theirs is all for free, you've got a, another big competitive disadvantage. So you need to open this up to create a free direct-to-consumer channel. Oh, boom. Look at that, then. And uh, what it does is it puts your customer at the center of the business. And if you remember, those of you that have worked in the consumer space, before everybody was traumatized by the fear of the Amazon juggernaut coming at them, so all they could talk about is technology and what should I do about it, what they used to talk about was, I tell you what we'll do, we'll put the customer at the center of our business. It's still the right thing to do, even though you might be about to be run over by the Amazon truck. And this enables you to do it. And the really powerful thing about it is it enables you to do it now. And this whole concept of marketing in the now. We do it for a lot of people. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Steve to actually talk about what we do in some more detail. Thank you all very much indeed. Product innovation. We believe in our product team and as a business that everything is about putting the customer at the heart of the universe of, of how you behave with people. Everything's about personalization, everything's about one-to-one -one connection, etc. So we believe that putting the customer at the heart of everything is, is the most important thing. So everything we do, everything we try and build, everything we try and design, everything we try and develop is to enable our customers, the retailers, to be able to put the customer at the heart of their world. And that's kind of like, that's the whole theory behind our entire roadmap and our whole development process. Um, we do a lot. We do increasingly more. We've made a full transformation to Agile methodologies, which has improved our, our productivity greatly. Um, a few things here over the years. The key call out is every year we're doing more and more and more and more features with the common theme of how do our customers keep how do our customers keep the consumer at the heart of everything? A few interesting things is around 2017 hyper personalization. How do you give everyone in say a lob laws? a different offer. Every single person can have 10 different offers. Um, we've done big things like opening up two data centers in the US to support uh, North American expansion. And going into this year, we've launched already, it's in this year's roadmap, but already delivered subscriptions as a new way of addressing cu uh, customer, a bit like the uh, sort of Amazon Prime model, uh, pay for something and then get a whole load of benefits associated to it. Um, friends and family for our, our app business and our food and beverages world, so the staff reward program can be extended. Um, and then the big one is we are moving to uh, the cloud with Google, and uh, Dave is going to speak to that in a minute. For me, because this is like an investor forum, the key thing is to show how we're scaling the business. And in order to scale the business, you've got to package things up into products and make them easy and easier to buy, easier to use, easier to buy, and easier to uh, sell, basically. So what I'm going to do is we've got two of our stars, my superstars, Rich and Sarah, and they're going to take you through one of our packages. It's the app package for the food and beverage industry. For me, it's really interesting because you can see the way we've taken all the theory that Tim has eloquently put about how we construct that into a sellable package that can be taken to market and quickly and easily sold on a global basis. Thank you.
Hi everyone. So yeah, we're going to talk to you about our Eagle Eye app and specifically how it is being sold to the food and beverage industry. So we're going to start with a short video. There are hundreds of thousands of customers out there, each with countless potential journeys. Here's just one example of how it works for Rachel. Rachel and the family have just finished their film. As they leave, she receives a push notification because my restaurant has just opened locally and are looking to drive footfall and frequency. They all head towards their local My Restaurant. As they approach, Rachel receives a reminder to redeem the offer. They sit down to enjoy their meal. As they pay for their meal, real-time data is fed into the Eagle Eye Air platform, allowing My Restaurant to see Rachel's unique ID against the time of redemption, location, and from which channel she received the promotion. As a result of redeeming her offer, Rachel receives an incentive encouraging her to return again. This can happen many times throughout one visit to multiple consumers. For example, Florence is enjoying her birthday Prosecco, which she received from my restaurant as a reward for booking a table for her party. Through knowing your customer, delivering engaging content and enabling a digital connection, you can truly optimize the customer experience. Eagle Eye, your customer in focus. I think we all know, and probably from what Tim and everyone else has been saying, digital is what we believe separates those businesses at the moment that are doing very well versus those that are struggling. Um, if we look at someone like Starbucks in the US and as, as an example, we know that they're seeing more than 30% of total transactions go through on a mobile phone, and more than 40% of their total sales are coming through from Starbucks rewards individuals. This is as a result of the fact that they have invested heavily in digital over the last few years, and despite the fact that average transaction value is pretty low and most of their customers are on the go, they have got huge uptake of mobile payments. As a result of this, they have got a huge wealth of data on all of their individual loyalty card holders, which means that they can personalize their experience every time they're coming into a Starbucks, and not just actually when they're in the store, but before, during, and after the transaction. So we believe that the market is ready and the time to act is now. Um, IDG did some research earlier this year and said that 89% of businesses are already on a digital first journey. And we know that 60% of restaurant users have already downloaded at least one mobile app. So this is already happening and this is what people want. We think what will separate the winners from the losers are the businesses that really understand their customers in detail and are able to use that understanding to personalize their experience using digital technology and marketing in the now. So not only is the market ready, but we believe customers are ready and they're hungry for this kind of technology. Digital promotions are the future. Generic paper-based promotions do not work. And we know that 75% of customers aren't happy to receive any form of generic communication these days. We mentioned uh, millennials on the bottom, 59% of whom want loyalty delivered through a digital mechanic. And we think it's important to remind everyone that a millennial is anyone who is currently between the ages of 22 and 37. It's a huge proportion of your business. And especially when we consider within food and beverage, these customers are more likely than any other generational group to be eating out of home and are therefore a huge proportion of the value sitting within your ecosystem. Uh, we also note that actually relevance and convenience are becoming more and more important for customers. And a lot of customers are saying that that is even more important than price. So it is critical to be able to communicate with someone in the now and to be able to offer them relevance and value with every communication. Uh, we all know in the post GDPR world, customers are more aware than ever of their own data. And if you're not offering value every time you communicate with them, they can simply opt out and go into the arms of your competitors. However, just having a mobile app isn't enough. We know that the number of retailers who launched apps in the last 12 months has doubled, so they are flooding the market. And more than 50% of customers who downloaded a retailer's app did so specifically to receive a voucher or a promotion. So there has to be an incentive to push someone through that journey to get them to register with you. However, more importantly, we know that the phone represents very valuable real estate to an individual. And for them to keep your brand on their phone, 
is something that has to offer them long-term value for them to be able to do that. We know that only 23% of retail apps last beyond the first 90 days. However, if you offer relevant content and provide stickiness with utility, so things like payment capabilities and relevant communications in the now, those stats improve significantly and you start to engage customers and they bring the value back into your ecosystem. So these are the three key challenges that we come across when we're interacting with businesses, specifically within food and beverage. The first challenge is that most of the time, restaurants do not know who the customers are who are sitting within their restaurants, who are ordering from them, and who are uh, they're making up all of the value of that business. If you don't know who your customers are, you increase significant increase in costs um, with um, generic promotions going out to the entire base and the cost of acquisition and reacquiring the same customer over and over again simply because you don't know who they are. The second issue is very closely linked to that. If you don't know who your customers are, how do you know what they want and how do you service their needs as an individual from your business? This leads to increasing frustrations which are only ever more increasing as customers come to expect businesses to know them and to know what they want. The final issue is how to stand out within a very, very saturated market. If you don't know who your customers are or what they want, how can you offer them a compelling reason to come back time and time again when there are so many other options available to them? And if you can't do that, you'll simply lose market share. So what we believe as a core solution to these problems is actually moving from the anonymous to the personal through the digital connection. And actually within this space, that has to be through mobile. The power of having a customer opted in to receive marketing communications from you is so valuable, which is why you see brands like McDonald's doing prime time TV advertising in the UK simply to incentivize a download of their mobile app. Once you've got that customer, you can track every single time they interact with your business and build a really valuable profile of what that customer's doing. And once you've got the data, you can really harness the power of marketing in the now. So what is the right message to send to the right person and when is the right time to do it? And from there, it's all about removing friction from the journey. So how do you make it easier and more rewarding for an individual to do business with you again and again? So what we see as the mobile app doing is it moves from being able to help businesses drive a visit through doing something like a two for one on a Tuesday every week to get the same customers back through the door to actually looking at how do you drive a specific mission from an individual. So if someone comes to a restaurant every day for lunch during the week, how do we get them in on a Saturday evening for dinner? Focusing on looking at increasing lifetime value. So rather than looking at customer X spent 20 pounds today, how do we know what Sarah spent over her entire lifetime with us? And really, how do we improve the experience so much that actually your customers are advocates of your brand and will start to share the message to get other people coming through those doors again? And now I will hand over to Rich to talk about how we actually win in this space. Okay, so the first thing, as we see it, that you need to do is to build an engaging digital destination. Uh, you need to build something that competes for that space on the user's personal device um, and ultimately provides the value to keep it there. Uh, it needs to make it easy to find content about your business. So in the, in the food and beverage space, it's about menus, it's about opening times. It enables you to find those restaurants. Uh, you need to make it current. So we know that keeping the content of an application fresh and regular and, and, and up to date makes a massive difference in terms of the downloads, registrations, and ongoing usage. One of our customers during the, the World Cup this year, over that two months duration, were able to increase their monthly average registrations in the app by over 17 times for that two month period. And using those tricks and techniques over the next six months, five, six months, we're able to keep those average monthly registrations at seven times higher than they were before. It needs to stay relevant. It needs to be relevant to customers. So using information that you know about the customer, their location, the status, and any loyalty program uh, helps to keep the, the user experience warmer and more, more relevant to them. And it needs to have utility. There's a lot of digital journeys out there already. Uh, one of the most popular is, is online bookings, table bookings in the food and beverage sector. Uh, we, we know that over 70% of all of those online table bookings come through the, from a mobile device. So it's really important to have that kind of utility within your application. You need to create compelling incentives to be able to track customers' behavior, your most loyal customers' behavior, and understand how they interact with your brand. You need to be able to build that promotion element 
that, enab that, that works for your customer base. We've seen huge success in category specific stamp cards, so food and drink type stamp cards. We've seen huge success in the ability to drive downloads through incentives and promotions and money off and percentage discounts. Um, and ultimately, you need that secure validation at, at, at the point of sale or on the e-com channel. And this has two reasons. Yes, it protects you against fraud and makes sure that the rules of that promotion are enforced and you've got the right products in the basket and so on. But also, it gives you that now moment. If somebody's in store transacting at the till at that point in time through the mobile app, you can deliver them a reward or a message to, it, to, it, to make that next action happen. We believe that you need to be able to partner with uh, external businesses to drive usage into your app. Uh, you, need to, you need access to brands that fund specific product-based promotions, and you need to be able to give that data back to those brands to, get, to give them a measure of success of that promotion. Again, you need, to be, you need validation to make sure that that transaction is done in real time, and you're giving that inf information back to your partner at the right time so that they can, that can influence their marketing spend. Ultimately, by creating those relationships and building your app audience, you can, you can provide an additional revenue stream into your business through that audience. You need to be able to send the right message at, to the right person, and you need to be able to do it at the right place and the right time. You need to be able to use the information gathered about who they are, usually in our, in our applications, it's name, gender, date of birth, uh, their favorite location, things like that. You need to be able to use what you know about their previous behavior. You need to, um, uh, the state of progress they are in terms of a promotion, the segment they may have been assigned as part of a, a segmentation task. And you need to be able to target those, those messages to groups and individuals and consumers at that right moment to give that next action and make that next action happen. Over time, you can begin to extend the capabilities of any application, providing more and more utility, learning about your customers, then building the right functionality and the right features to drive more visits and spend. You need to be able to offer those best facilities for your customer base. Um, different utilities work better within different sub-verticals of the F&B space and different demographics within that as well. Uh, things like uh, incorporating wireless charging to drive downloads or pay at table services have shown to, to, to increase users' average lifetime significantly. And ultimately, with an always-on, highly engaged customer base, it's crucial to be able to measure the impact of those incentives and those missions that you're setting them off on. This will enable you to understand which tactics work for your customer base and, and which tactics actually meet those objectives as well. Successful businesses, we believe, are the ones that don't stand still and keep generating this learning loop to drive data back into the business and optimize what they're doing with their customers. And the solution The Eagle Eye app. It's a brandable and configurable mobile application available on iOS and Android, uh, which we can use to engage and interact with new and existing customers uh, and incentivize them to visit and spend. It connects with your POS and validates in every customer, customer interaction in real time, passing data back to those people that need it. It delivers those actionable results and insight in real time. And it's tried, tested, and proven. We're growing our, user, our active user base at over 150,000 uh, app users per month. Um, we, each month, we see a really high active user rate within that of over 45% of people actually transacting at Till. We have a very high conversion rates across all of our applications on offers, uh, particularly when compared to traditional, more traditional digital means like email, over five times higher. And ultimately, through, through our application, we can increase average users' lifetime of applications by over 30%. And that's over 150 days compared to 90, which is the industry standard.
Hi, I'm David Elmer. I'm CRO here at Eagle Eye. It's been a great growth story so far for Eagle Eye. Um, and with this growth comes change. Uh, the change comes in technology, and the capabilities the technology has had to change too. So from the start, in Steve's bedroom, things have changed. We are now in data centers. That was really the big first step change. So that move into data centers allows us to cope with the transaction volumes, the clients, and the transactions that we now got to deal with. Um, the rapid growth at Eagle Eye has been supported by rapid growth in our data centers. And you can see from the slide, we've now got over 200 servers in four data centers in two continents. So the next step change, as Steve mentioned earlier, is our move into Google Cloud. The, cloud, uh, the move to cloud will allow us to take advantage of the latest tech and the latest tools available in Google Cloud. The move to Google Cloud is now a, a well-trodden path. Um, the likes of HSBC, Coca-Cola, and even Apple uh, are now using Google Cloud. Just some stats, 3,000 transactions per second, um, 1.2 billion API requests a month, 200 million transactions, uh, and growing. So it's all pretty impressive stuff, but we want to do more, and Google Cloud will enable us to do this. What does it give us? What does it give us the ability to do? It gives us the ability to become even more agile. It allows us in to introduce and embrace continuous development, um, allowing us to release more features faster for our clients. It gives us the ability to, uh, the ability to expand into new geographies. Uh, it no longer takes six months and a million pounds to open a data center. We can literally spin up a new data center in a new geography in minutes. Um, it gives us the ability to auto scale and increase and decrease performance and capacity as we need to. So for example, for Black Friday, we can spin up servers um, literally in, in minutes and in seconds now to cope with the, cope with the, with the increase in uh, transactions, et cetera, that may come across those periods. It gives us access to new tools. It gives us access to new technology, which allows us to take advantage of those features and tool sets going forward. One of the big areas we're looking at, Steve mentioned it earlier as well, is the, is the data side. So this allows us to look at big data, allows us to look at AI tools, allows us to play with machine learning and really turbocharge what we can do on the marketing capability to deliver our marketing the now capabilities. So in summary, hold on to your hats. 2019 is going to be exciting. Eagle Eye is living its dream. We are bigger, better and faster. And with that, I've got to hand the microphone as well as the clicker. Back to Steve. Right, for a second. Just one second. Um, just on what, what David said there, I saw an article at the weekend about Barclay Card and Black Friday. Um, they go, they, they're excited about processing 1,100 transactions per second. I'm sat there going, ha ha, Times newspaper, I do 3,000. Um, anyway, that's a size. <laughs> I'm just being slightly <laughs> egotistic for a second. Um, I work with Loblaws. So um, when we uh, met with Loblaws two and a half years ago, I think it was, um, they posed as a challenge, which was to take the, the vision we have of a customer at the heart of everything and make it enterprise scale on a level that we'd never touched before. Um, so we created the digital wallet. The digital wallet, everyone talks about it, they hear the word wallet and they think Apple. Um, my version of the digital wallet is, because I'm a techie geek, it's a data construct that means that I can cr treat every single person in a program as an individual for their lifetime and as they develop, as they grow old, as their behaviors change, et cetera, et cetera. And I can join those individuals together in households and friendships and relationships. So I can create a truly one-to-one -one relationship in data and expose that on APIs for the execution of, of big retailers or the wallets, et cetera. This is pretty powerful stuff. If you want to have a one-to-one -one relationship, you've got to have your data on a one-to-one -one relationship and your identities. Um, so the wallet allows you to identify people in households and as individuals, and allows you to give them entitlements, whether that be a coupon, a points account, a gift card, a stamp card, a continuity card, any range of services in one wallet for me. And I might be married to Rich, I'm not, but I could be. Um, and then we could join and share our, 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 our offers together. I should have picked Sarah, sorry, Rich. Um, it allows all the marketing data to be tracked together. And if you can't do this, if, 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 a, if our clients can't get the data onto an individual level, you can't truly reach the nirvana that Tim's talking about, is you've got to be data driven. Because otherwise your data is all in one big bucket and you don't actually know what you've got. 
Last week, we had our quarter one uh, trading update. I wanted to give you a little bit more on that, first of all. So we started the year well. Growth on the top line of 26%, driven by wins that came through in the previous year, doing more with issuance partners and brands to drive transactions, and also deepening our existing customer relationships. As you all know, we do that really well with the result of the products that Steve and the team are able to generate. Underneath the bonnet, the air platform, the real core strategic part of the business, has grown by 36%. That now represents about 90% of our business. So the real focus growing at a really, really nice rate. When Tim and I saw you a couple of months ago, we talked about sectors and new sectors that we might want to go into. And we highlighted them, one, as quick service restaurants, and two, as food services. Why those? Because they're nice adjacent services to what we offer to do today, not doing anything too radical, but really the offering around promotions and loyalty really resonates in those sectors. And we were pleased to announce uh, last week that we'd won our first quick service restaurant with Burger King. Not a bad one to start with. So really pleased with that. And um, three-year contract, hopefully starting with 74 restaurants, but hopefully we'll expand and deepen like we always do with our really good customers. The other thing that Tim and I talked about when we saw you was about the volume through the platform. Uh, they grew significantly for the full year uh, to June 2018. And again, in the first quarter, we're seeing that strong growth. Over 200 million transactions going through the platform in the first quarter. That's a, over 500% growth in the volumes going through the platform year on year. Why is that important? Really important to show the real proven scale, especially when we're now going out and talking to new potential clients about we really can do this now. This isn't theoretical stuff. The next point really is about Tim talked specifically about being leaner, doing things better, simpler, cheaper way. And we've started, those things are starting to really come into play. And we cited in the trading update that the EBITDA loss was materially reduced from this time last year. So if you take our recurring revenue model, which was 72% for the first quarter, low churn rate, enough cash to deliver our plan, then really, you then take the addressable market, which has grown as a result of loyalty coming on board uh, fully this year. We're at board are really confident about delivering the numbers that are out in the market for this next coming year. I've got to just another couple of slides. These really speak to some of the questions that investors asked me uh, in the last roadshow, and so I thought it's worth picking on, on those points. First of all, how does our revenue break down? First of all, if I just go run through the SaaS business model, we charge a fee for joining the platform and implementation fee. That represents about 23% of our revenue. Uh, this is, these numbers are for the year to June 2018. And then in terms of recurring revenue, we split those in, into two elements. One, the license fee, access to the platform, support and maintenance. That represented about 34% of the business revenue. And then transaction fees, which was 44%. So that's the per click <coughs> element of the transactions. To understand trans transaction fees a, a little bit clearer, you've got to then break the business into the three component parts that we sell in terms of the product. One around gift, two around promotions, and three around loyalty. Loyalty being new and the real fundamental difference between uh, the year to June 2018 and before. There's an intrinsic link between the value uh, that the consumer can get and what we can charge to the retailer. So if you take those elements down, first of all, in terms of gift, well, the average gift transaction ranges somewhere between £10 and £50. So we can charge a much higher price per transaction for those transactions, but there are a much lower per percentage of actually the transactions going through the platform. You can see that in the little graph there. So we can charge somewhere between 10 and 30p for uh, a gift transaction. Then if you move into promotions, my, my example, you've probably all heard it before, it is really 50p off a, um, a six pack of Coke would be an example of that. Well, you couldn't charge 10p a transaction for something like that. So we're talking about pence for that. So somewhere between 0 and 5p is the average transaction we charge 
in the promotion space. And then when you get into loyalty, if you think about it into, into earn and burn of points, you've got to get a lot more earning and burning of points to get real value to the consumer. So there we charge parts of pence. And that really is sort of where the huge value has come in in terms of the volumes going through the platform there. Um, 250 million transactions going through the platform. And that really has altered the price per transaction, but opened up a new market for us going forward. Hopefully that's a little bit clearer for people. Then the next question uh, sort of we got asked, you know, what's the typical sort of life cycle of a customer, and I'm going to attempt to sort of explain that a little bit clearer for you now. First thing to note, that our average contract length is somewhere between three and five years. And what I've illustrated here on, on this graph is sort of what a tier one contract would look like over, over a life cycle. Our best customers, this is the, the model that we aim to achieve. First point to note is around the implementation fee. Implementation fees will vary in terms of size depending on whether you're doing an app build like Sarah and Rich were talking about earlier on, which we do in weeks, compared to where we're doing a replatforming for something like Loblaws, which we're talking about years. But there is an implementation fee which is done on a TNM basis for that. Then in terms of license fee, which I'd explained before, license fees generally start on day one, but at a lower rate. When we go into launch, they then go up to their full rate and then sort of stay uh, consistent along the life cycle of the contract. Transactions were a transaction business, really, really important. Transactions grow with further digital adoption and customers really understanding the full value the platform can give. And what we see when, when we see our customers cross that digital Rubicon, there's more and more reasons that they want to take more functionality of the platform and volumes grow up grow as, as uh, the contract um, increases in length. One, one point to note here is generally what we're seeing, particularly in the bigger customers, that they want tiered volume bands. So you sort of have to get to the next step and then you'll get a step up in revenue. And we're seeing this more and more with our customers because they want the insight to be able to budget accordingly. Then the, um, the next point is around deep, and we always um, make the point that actually what we are really good at, and this is credit to Steve and the team around the real value of the platform, is that customers, once they're in, they really do deepen and take on more services from us. And what we see on average is 12 months after launch, we're seeing customers investigating what more can the platform do, what more can I give my customer, and the real value in this air platform. And then the last point here is around brands. I've shown this in year five, and as, as sort of we've talked about here and Rich highlighted earlier on, particularly in the app world, brands give real new value to a proposition. And the network that we have, particularly in the food and beverage industry, really powers that growth around brands. But from the uh, tier one um, sector, we haven't really cracked it yet in terms of the brand opportunity. So in terms of the numbers that are out in the market, there's no assumptions around brand revenue coming from that. But it's an area that we're looking at and we will continue to explore. Because actually, if we can get that, you can see that there's further opportunity with a significant client as well. That's all from me. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, uh, for your contributions. Clearly, what we're seeking to do is, is to grow the business. And the most important thing is that we have different opportunities and different drivers of growth. Uh, and I think we now have four credible ways in which we can, when you can expect us to grow the business going forward. The first is what we've talked about ever since I joined, which is this model about win new customers, get them transacting and then deepen. And Lucy just talked about that, and that continues, it's completely valid. And you saw that one times to five times through the life of a contract. We are starting to see that become a reality uh, in, in the contracts that are you know, three, three and more years old. Uh, the second thing, and Steve talked about it today with the digital wallet, you know, and as I explained at the, at the full year, that took us from being a provider of promotions and services and gift to being a provider of loyalty. <coughs> the loyalty market is a very big market. So the available market that we are able to, ad to address through our product development can get larger. 
And we can now have conversations with people about loyalty, which we never could have before. And we've talked about subscriptions. We, uh, we, we showcased apps to you today. We don't talk about apps very often, but actually it's an impressive business. It's an impressive product. And you can see from the way we packaged it up, I, I do just remind you, uh, you, you were in the role as a food and beverage marketing department manager for, for that presentation, that you know we, we are confident that we will be able to knock that out. We'll do a, a fashion version of it, we'll do a general retail version of it, uh, and, and that we think that actually we've got some great function in our apps. Uh, we're starting to be at tippy toe to start be doing some quite interesting stuff with the data. There's, you know, there's plenty to come there. So second uh, pillar of growth, product development. Third pillar of growth, new geographies. And clearly you all wait with bated breath to just hear whether it, where the next um, you know, thing is going to come from. Uh, but we are quite encouraged by, uh, I'm in Canada and uh, North America with uh, Lucy next week, with the moves that are being made down in Australia. And we've got some other interesting stuff going on in Europe. So, you know, there's things starting to happen there. <coughs> And then finally, new sectors, QSR and, uh, and food service. So I think you can be confident that, you know, as we go on, uh, we are developing more ways to grow the business. And therefore, we are less reliant on any one, uh, you know, one thing to, to be, uh, to, to be the, the driver of our success. That was all I wanted to say. I think the next one definitely is actually... Q and A, isn't it? Uh, thank you all very much for your patience. We would be very pleased, uh, the management team, to um, answer any questions you have. If you have questions, it would help us hugely if you could identify yourself uh, when you ask them. Good afternoon. Very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I was curious about the pain that had to be endured to onboard the Loblaws um, platform, and are you expecting similar levels of pain? Uh, whenever you try to do subsequent implementations at scale, or will it be easier? Tim, and then perhaps a... a oh, well, I was going to I, I was going to let I was going to let Steve answer that one. He, he he he's the boy who, on our team who relishes the pain. It's a good question. The um, so from an eagle eye point of view, uh, we our pain, our personal pain, was the the challenge set to us was. Was, was an order of magnitude over what the capacity we'd ever put through our te technology before, um, which we cracked. We cracked it a long time before the actual go live. Um, what, from a techie point of view, and I apologize, that's the only angle I can answer, I think the bit, the pain, the pain was a lot more around big organizations have very, very complex ecosystems. And as great as we could be, there are lots of things that have to fall into place. There are only like two times a year you can really launch something new because of the way the trade goes and stuff like that. So from a technology point of view, um, we, we can roll out this capability in weeks now to new clients. Um, whether the client can or can orchestrate everything else around it and the PR and everything like that, that's outside of my control. But we, we, we made great steps forward. So what would have taken us a year to do, say, a lob laws a year ago, we, we can do in weeks now. We've got evidence of that with other clients where they've called us up on the Monday and they've been, li they've been live from our point of view a, a month later sort of thing. And if you engage with smaller retailers going forward, um, much smaller scale, do you still have the same uh, legacy system integration problems? Is the job as big to talk no. to the legacy systems on a small trader? No, so that, 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 and that's a really good point. You kind of like, and again, apologies, techie. Um, you've got enterprise type stuff, which is big, takes time, big organization. And then you've got like the SME market over here. So the reason for doing the packaging demo is the SME market wants to just buy something off the shelf, flick a few switches, and next day it's working. So it's not quite next day, but um, there we, we, I won't say who, because I don't think we've ever, we've announced it, but we, a small client uh, bought one of our packages off us uh, three weeks ago, and they go live next week. Um, but it's not the same sc scale as a, as a Loblaws, clearly. Um, so package up for the small, medium enterprises so you can sell quickly, sell product, sell fast, make it easy to use, make it 
constantly add features, get more transactions through it, and deepen our capabilities for enterprise sales so that we can do more function functionality at this mammoth scale up here. So you've got to, and part of the transition that we're going through as a business now is how do you service enterprise and SME to a high, high quality, a bit like Salesforce. Yeah. How, do you, how do you become Salesforce? Um, just going from your slide, you talk about 82% satisfaction on 16 million. And it's really just a quick comment. Everybody always focuses on the, on the satisfaction, but the 18% are not satisfied, which equals to two and a half million on the back of an envelope, I suppose. Yeah. Why wouldn't they be satisfied? Um, multiple different reasons. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> uh, many different reasons. Um, uh, some people will never be satisfied. Uh, one example. Um, we had, we had some initial uh, challenges around people perceiving their offers as not uh, the best. Um, and there's a strategy behind what we offer our consumers in terms of value. Um, there were um, uh, transition uh, steps some consumers had to go through. For instance, if they were on the two programs, uh, basically in the new program you want to bring over your balances from the two old programs. So there were some steps for some people. Uh, and, and, and with that comes a little bit of work and some people didn't like those steps. So there's multiple reasons. Uh, are we focused on, on having everyone uh, uh, completely satisfactory? Absolutely. So we've got an ongoing list in terms of what the pain points are and what we can do better. Yeah. And this one's more for you, Tim, I, I think. Um, you talk about quarter one transactions, 200 million, which if you put a annualize it 800 million. You also talk about 3 million active users. And I never know what you mean by active users. So it, they're, it, they're very different things. Yeah. Um, the, the, the first is transactions through the platform of any sort from anywhere from Mitchells and Butler, Loblaw, Sainsbury, Asda, Uncle Tom Cobley. Yeah all just rolled up to a huge number, the three million active users is three million people who are actively using an Eagle Eye app. And those are people who have transacted on that app within the last 100, well, in the last month, I apologize. Yeah. And that's the challenge, to get them to use it every week, not every month. Well, that's the reasons to, re that's the reasons to redeem point. Yeah, actually, in, not necessarily with, a, with, with, with an app, because um, if, if they're not engaging with your brand on a weekly basis, then pushing them stuff on a weekly basis is the wrong thing to do. If you know they're on a monthly cycle, you've got to work, <clears throat> you've got to work out what cycle they're on and then push them the, um, push them the, uh, push them the, the offer then. But, but, but keep, Keep it active, keep it fresh, keep pushing information so that people, you know, uh, Sarah said this, you can't underestimate psychologically the importance of opting in and having it as real estate on your phone. You know, that is, that is giving a bit of your phone, giving a bit of yourself to that brand. Uh, and it, it give, it's giving permission. Uh, those are probably psychologically a little bit deeper than, than people think they are in terms of the importance to brands and why, why it matters perhaps more than some of them think it does. I was wondering if you could um, provide any information uh, or bring to light, I appreciate Loblaw was useful, just in terms of, in, let's say in the UK and the, the loyalty programs where the, you know, they're not your customers, if you could give us a quick comparison about you know, the features and what's good and bad with those loyalty programs that you don't, that you, that aren't customers of yours and how maybe the Eagle Eye Air platform compares. And then, and then secondly is to, you know, th this instant messaging, what sort of data it, or is there behind that that customer is actually appreciating that? Um, I'm not sure how I would feel about it. Um, so yes, just in terms of is this, is there actually, you know, good, good, good uptake uh, and, you know, actually not just, and you know, in in uh, upselling them and they're spending more in the store? Uh, I think um, the leader in, 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 in the UK in terms of um, 
technical innovation and, and real-time program and personalization is probably Sainsbury uh, under what they call New Nectar. Um, the common feature between the Sainsbury's program and the uh, Loblaw program is Eagle Eye. Um, the reason why that's not a big deal is because it's a trial in Wales. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a national rollout. They are doing it in a very different way than the way that Loblaw did it. Uh, they're clearly much more concerned about Steve's ability to sleep at night than, than the Canadians were. Um, and then I think the what I would, you, you know, the scheme, the scheme I know most about, obviously, is the Tesco scheme, albeit a bit historically. Um, and um, for a lower cost than one quarterly mailing, Loblaw are able to engage and talk to their customers every week. So that's the prize, that's the benefit. Um, and um, they'll all have to go there. Because Jim is right, you know, watching people Instead of taking value from the consumer off the table, take cost of running the scheme off the table, yeah? And, 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 and allow the consumer to continue to enjoy a rich scheme. So, so I think the, the direction of travel is clear. It's just a question of when people get to it and how they get to it. I'll try and answer the second question there, which was about uh, potential customer resentment. I think you really look at a real life example and uh, Sarah and Rich talked you through the app, and I would, those of you who get the chance, download the Green King season ticket app because it gives you an, a real idea of uh, um, how, we're, uh, how we're working with our customers uh, and gives you the opportunity to get a free pine ticket. So. <laughs> but, you know, if you, can grow, if you can develop a profile where there's a regular drinker on a Friday and Saturday night and he or her has X number of drinks, if you're offering them a meal deal... Uh, when you know they haven't traditionally had a meal deal, um, you're offering them a value and you're hopefully getting a greater yield from that customer at that time. So there's a mutuality there. So, uh, I mean, the use of any app uh, has to be done intelligently by the marketeer, by, the, by our, our clients, in order to, be, to have perceived ad value rather than resentment. Just l can I just lastly... the. Is there any way, I mean, the email marketing is very tried and tested. Are you able to, are your customers able to integrate so that they, they can choose when to uh, send an email uh, preference and either raw an instant or, you know, via the app? Yeah, yes, so, so they push, are. But, but you push, saw, email, yeah, SMS. But you saw, they, you, they can, absolutely, and they can do both and probably should. But you saw the statistic up there, five times more likely to respond to an app push than they are to an email. Clearly, uh, what we've seen today and what you've demonstrated certainly over the last year is, is that you've got a proven platform now and you've got some uh, very strong reference clients, you know, global names. Um, just wondering then, I think you, the company's guided to continue, continuing to um, spend roughly the level of amortization on continuing development. So my question is, what are the priorities for, for that spend? Um, and given the position of the company now, in that you are clearly generating strong economic value now and in the future for clients like Loblaw, um, how you utilize that spend to capture greater economic value for uh, Eagle Eye and, uh, and its shareholders? I think it's a steep one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boom. What? That one lands on me. <laughs> well, I, I, think Steve, I think, Steve, if you turn it into ordinary man speak, it's what's the, what, what's the priorities for the platform? Um, it's kind of like, like, like the roadmap. And, and, and you, actually, your question and the gentleman behind's questions are linked because they are, that's where the investment goes. So we're currently doing... Um, whatever it was, 200 million. They're redemptions, by the way. They're not offer creations. They are redemptions. They are people redeeming. Like, we're creating billions of offers. Um, so what we're going to do, that's where the investment goes now, is 
Right, this is a platform that has got data centers in the UK and the US. Uplift that, upscale that. It, and I, I joke when I say I don't want to be Salesforce. To a certain extent, I want to be Facebook, Salesforce, and all those people where you have this one globalized platform that it doesn't matter what country it is, we can access any client in any, in any territory really, really quickly. Okay, so you, you spend money on that. Then to your point, it's really good because Malcolm and yourself are quite right. And this is why like, we selected Google as a partner for the cloud. So you could have gone to AWS, although a lot of our clients may have taken a small issue with us paying Amazon any money. Um, or it could have been Azure or, or, or any of the other cloud providers out there. But when we did the analysis of Google Cloud, it's the AI machine learning capabilities that we're going to have access to. Because to your question, exactly at the moment, it's very much... I don't, I don't know sure I've got the right word for it. In, introspective, like it's like cursory data. Did you care that you got that offer, which may have peed you off, or it may not have done, at, at six o'clock on a Friday? As you bang that into learning tools, we'll be able to, you'll be able to learn who responds. So actually, maybe your response rate would be better if you got the offer on a Wednesday for a Friday. Malcolm's might be, he's in the pub, he'll always have another one, so give him another one now. You know, but, but you've got to have capability with technology that allows you to do that. So that's why we picked Google to gain access to the Google AI engines and things like that, so that we can start going to the next level down. Um, and then, where was I going? So it's all about where the investment goes. I, I, I think Sorry. the, I, I, I mean, I, I also think that if, if I sort of get the tail end of the question, um, you know, the important messages for shareholders are, with our debt facility, we've got enough cash to prosecute the plan that we lay in front of you. Um, the, the, the work that we're doing with Google and the cloud lets that cash go a bit further in terms of new geographies and the shock of not having to come back necessarily when we win a new geography, so that's good, I would hope, too. That we're moving towards EBITDA profitability and we're, we're moving towards cash generation and we're telling you about that and that's what we're going to do. But what I do not want to say to you at this stage is we're going to hold up, throw the whole thing into reverse, we're going to stop spending and because that's not what we're going to do. We are still a business that, you know, and don't look at 26%, look at 36%. We're still a business that is growing at 36, 39%, and we want to keep going like that for as many years forward as any of us need to think about, and we will need to invest in that growth. Whether we need to invest everything that we generate in the same levels, that remains to be seen. It, it, and it depends upon two things, I think. How clever we are in innovating in our own minds the roadmap that we create for the product, but also what our clients ask us to do. And because and we have this, this combination of having a view of the world, which we get on and build, and then our clients saying, we've got this view of the world, will you get on and build it with us or for us? And, and we have to balance th those two things. Just one build, which is, uh, I think it's a slight interpretation of your question too, because it came up a couple of times on the roadshow is, are we going to keep innovating our product? Are we going to continue putting two million quid into the product each year? And um, the answer is yes, we are going to continue to innovate and put money into the product. And Jim highlighted the reason why they chose us. Loblaws chose us rather than any big global player around the world for what we could do today, but also the future. And it's the future piece around what Steve's talked about on the road path. That's beyond what we're doing with Google Cloud. It's about giving real functionality that adds real value, that drives the stats that people like Jim are looking for in terms of consumer engagement. Sorry, another layer of build. Thank you. I, was, I thought you were going to ask another one. I was going to say, for, for God's sake, make the second one an easier one. Um, could you just explain, once you've got a customer on board, who helps them to get the most out of the data? And, and are they putting the office together, or, or do you help them do that, or do they bring in other people to help them do that? It depends. Uh, I, I mean, it's a, it's a horses for courses uh, thing to some extent. Um, Loblaw, as you can probably imagine, quite capable of doing their own marketing. <laughs> and uh, so, that, so they do that, uh, and, and we facilitate it. Some smaller businesses, we can tip them the wink and say, you know, have you tried this? Why don't you do that? 
Um, and we're able to do that in a more data-based way because of the three million uh, active, you know, we are starting to learn quite a lot about the way these things behave. Um, we have a business, as you know, which where we basically do broker branded activity to particularly our food and beverage clients. A lot of uh, the drink manufacturers are keen to drive trial of their products. That We are involved in that and we do make some money out of that. Uh, so I, I think it's a horses for courses thing. But in a standard thing, a salesman goes out, wins a piece of business, and then as part of do, do, bringing that business on board, we will workshop shop that with, with a business analyst and probably a product manager. That then gets handed over to the business analyst and the product manager who deliver the project. And during that process, it then gets handed over in the sales team from the guy or girl who goes out and wins the business to actually their long-term account manager. And what we try and do is we try and have a salesperson and somebody with technical understanding and project expertise who goes with that client for, I mean, clearly, you know, staff churn, promotions and all that, but goes with that client. And so our sales director still has a very close relationship with Mitchells and Butler, even though he's now on the exec. Steve has, still has a very close rela relationship with JD Sport because he, you know, they will, and Pizza Express. So we, the relationships do carry on, but it, we go from winning an account to account, and we do have an account management function, which is unusual, I think, for a SaaS business, but it's because we have so many additional services that we are able to sell, hence the profile of the, the, the client from one time to five times over five years. That's the account management, the deepen function. I hope that explains a bit. Um, hi, just um, on that, to that point really, um, as you look to sort of allocate resource and, and focus on the good clients, um, how important is it to you that they already have an established uh, downloaded app base, given that you can't drive the downloads of apps, you can only drive interaction once they already have the apps on the phone, um, and you're talking about that deepening over one to five years, you know, would you, would you push away a client if they didn't have enough? No, no, it doesn't matter at all. Um, we're talking to uh, a number of sports clubs, um, not, not from the point of view of the fan base, but from the point of view of what fans consume while they're on site. And what I said to them is, exaggerating slightly to make a point, if you've got five fans on your app, then we will put an SDK into your app. We would not recommend you have two apps. You know, if people have given up one tile of their real estate to their association with that team, that's probably enough. Asking them to do two is a lot. So it very much depends. We do great work for Greg's, but it's Greg's app, it's not our app. They've got an SDK, which gives them all our function, but it's embedded in the Greg's app. We do great work for Green King, that is our app. And actually, as an outsider, you would probably struggle to tell whether it's one of our apps or whether it's somebody else's app, it just depends. The important thing is that you've got the audience. And if you haven't got an audience, then you get an app. And then, but and, and interestingly, you know, one of the things I say when I'm sort of talking to industry bodies and stuff, uh, the, in my view, the only people who do this getting on for well are JD. And I've got a picture on my phone uh, and they've taken it down, which, given it's the holiday season, is probably not surprising. But three or four weeks ago, they had nine-foot cardboard iPhones on Oxford Street saying, download the JD app, get subscriptions. Now, the reason they do that is because they know how incredibly valuable everybody is who does that. When you're watching the football at the weekend, if you look on the, as the boards go up around the, the, around the perimeter, of, of, of it will say JD.com, get the app, or some version of that. When you go home on the tube tonight, you see a JD ad, it will say get the app. That is, these apps, customers, are so valuable that you need that much marketing. Really, how many times have you been into a restaurant where it says get the app? When can, can you think of it? You know, can you, it's quite hard to remember, isn't it? I think we're going to get an awful lot of that coming at us because it's what people need to do. So you've got to build, if you haven't got a customer base, you've got to build one. Most of the, in fact, if not most, if not all, of those 3 million customers under management through our app platform are new. 
we, we, we've never, I can't think of a client where we've imported their base. Yeah, they, cool. they are all new. So, so it grows very quick. You know, if you get the right proposition, the right utility to the app, you, these numbers come really, really quite quick. And uh, if you get a chance to talk to Rich afterwards, there's some tricks that out there where you manage to increase like the registrations by 17 times by certain things, promotions and stuff like that. But we didn't, we haven't imported anyone. So that three million is all homegrown sort of thing. When you have the sort of 23% of apps left standing after 90 days, you've grown that number for the, the versions that you create to? Don't know. So it's 30% increase basically on that over 150 yeah. days. Okay, thank you. I hope you've come away with um, a number of key messages. And the first one is that the time for our technology is now. You can't read about what's happening in the retail trade without uh, understanding that the twin pressures of cut price activity and e-commerce needs a different response from those people in the high street. We believe the product set that we have is that response. And we continue to innovate our product. We launched as a business that was mainly focused on promotion. As you've heard today, we've moved from promotion to loyalty to gift to a digital wallet and a single view of a customer. Uh, Lucy described our four pillar growth strategy and we believe we have a solid business. We have high gross margins. We've demonstrated our ability to control our operating expenditure over the last few years. And as we said on more than one occasion today, uh, we are confident that we will go EBITDA positive during 2019 and we do not need any more cash to achieve our immediate goals. I'm enormously grateful for the team today, Tim, Lucy, Steve, Rich, Sarah, David, and also Joe Kennedy, who's put on this uh, whole day. And I'm very grateful for all of you uh, putting up with uh, us for several hours. Thank you. <laughs>